So I just would like to show you, this is my website, and I told you on the left column, this one, let me just uh, scroll down a bit. Uh, you see that there are, the col there is the column of the teaching activity, here you have the supporting material for the classes uh, on advanced technology. But this year, if you look here, basically you have all the links, I just downloaded my introduction here. And um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, videos of the lecture, if you click here, go, you go to my YouTube page, and this is the playlist of our lectures, which is empty, of course. It would be nice if I would be able uh, to put the videos before making the lectures. But from tonight, you will be able to find that. So you post the video immediately after? Yes, let me say that sometimes, maybe one day later. And uh, because I need to, to put the video online from here. I can't do that from home because I need a very fast connection. So tonight uh, probably I'm not able to, uh, to upload uh, as soon as I finish, but tomorrow morning as soon as I get here I upload that. Okay? Perfect. Another thing that I forgot to tell you, I have also a Twitter page uh, which uh, I don't use much uh, and uh, basically I use the Twitter page only for sending communication to students. Uh, like uh, you see here, it's, uh, sorry, Facebook? No, it's Twitter. I, I have a Facebook page, but I prefer not to use it because uh, it's, uh, you know, I have the website that already allows me to make available things and uh, etc. So I, I'm, I'm not a Facebook user. I have my account, but I didn't use that. But this is Twitter. Twitter, I think it is useful because if you become one of my followers, I can reach you from my mobile phone and if I am late to a lecture or I have user communication to you, usually I use Twitter. And uh, it's, it's, uh, if you don't have a Twitter account, it's very easy to, to join Twitter. But as I said, if you look at the, my past tweets, uh, I used uh, in the past semester, I think uh, I used it four times. Like you see, it's Italian, but I communicated like I am five minutes late, I, am, uh, I need to to change the room, uh, Twitter is very useful because from the mobile phone I can I can get to your mobile phone directly because uh, you can subscribe for an SMS communication which is free and you can receive the communication very easily and uh, you know it's an opportunity but as I said maybe that I send uh, five uh, messages during uh, and usually when I am late because you know I am a commuter so sometimes the train is late I send a message when I am 10 minutes late it's not really it's not really necessary that you subscribe okay so now let me switch to this uh, slides so Prof, one more question yeah um, what's the difference between this course and the uh, water resource engineering uh, you mean uh, okay this course yeah this is a good question sorry for that i forgot to tell you basically the exam is made uh, separately so I make an exam for my six credits and Professor Lamberti, I think he's uh, your teacher, makes uh, the exam uh, because uh, you are from ERE, correct? Me? No, no, engineer, civil. So I didn't understand your question. No, I mean, yes, there is uh, advanced hydrology and water, water resources resource management. No. And you have water resource engineering, something like that. Yeah, but water resource engineering is the integration of advanced hydrology and water resources management and coastal engineering. So this, is, this applies for the students uh, from ERE. Mm -hmm. So basically they have a course which is called uh, water uh, engineering, I think, which is, again, the integration of advanced hydrology, six uh, CFU, and coastal engineering, six CFU. So which means when I make my exam of advanced hydrology, I don't make any difference on the students. I make my exam for six CFU and I give a mark. Then for the students of environmental engineering, they may take the exam with Professor Lamberti and it's six CFU more with another mark. And then we make one registration only, which is the average mark, which gets the average mark between the two courses. And usually the last professor that makes the exam uh, registers it and uh, we get in touch of course uh, when I make exams to students of ERE I communicate to Professor Lamberti what is your mark and your name and then the same uh, he does with me 
and then the last one computes the average, provided we can do that, and, uh, and uh, we register the exam. It's, it's clear because I forgot to make the difference, to put in evidence the difference between the students of civil engineering and they have just my exam and uh, as soon as I finish the exam I register the mark and the students of ERE have the integrated exam. Is it clear? Okay. Your question is clear. So, uh, it's, it's clear, I was just because in the, I'm from civil engineering and I was looking at the options of yeah. attending this class or attending Ah, okay. No, you mean the other course? Yeah. Uh, which, no, it's a, a different story because, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm focusing on hydrology for water resources management. And the other course, I don't remember, if you look at the, at the study plan, at, at the description, at the course description, you see that there is a difference. Yeah, I think they are more at the flood control. Yeah, flood control, yeah, it's more flood control oriented, yes. While in water resources management, I'm not focusing on flood, just very briefly, but I'm focusing on drought management. And, uh, and instead, the Professor Todd, she's uh, focusing on floods. So there is no overlap for sure because I, I, we had a, a very long meeting to conceive our uh, course description and uh, subject plan in order not to have any overlap. So basically my suggestion would be if you are more interested in, uh, in, uh, in floods and, uh, and uh, flood control, flood mitigation, uh, probably it's more appropriate if you attend the other course, they are independent. If you are more interested in water resources management, this is your course, of course. Yeah, I, I, I didn't understand uh, your, your question, but now it's clear to me. Okay, good. So basically, we are, we are focusing on, uh, as you can see, advanced hydrology and water resources management. First of all, I want to clarify uh, what hydrology is uh, from my perspective. And uh, you already had, many of you already had a background in hydrology. But uh, I would like to, to provide my perspective on hydrology and water resources management. And first of all, let me clarify the learning objectives. And uh, basically, we talk about uh, solving problems to secure, to secure water for people. And uh, this is water resources management, but I have a part of advanced hydrology, which is included in my subject, which is uh, finalized, which aims to provide the hydrological basis for water resources management. So I'm not making a comprehensive treatment of hydrology. I'm making a comprehensive treatment of hydrology for water resources management. Basically, the target of this subject, again, is to learn how to efficiently secure water to people. This is a very topical issue, a very topical issue today for reasons that we all know. And the main reason are that, uh, you know, if, Fresh water demands are increasing and fresh water availability is decreasing. Demands are increasing because of increasing population and increasing needs. Because if you look back in the past, people needed much less water than today. Today, our lifestyle and our, uh, let, let's say, uh, wealth level is increased and we need more water. On the other hand, we have less water available. Why? Because some people say that there is climate change that is causing a decrease in water availability. This is not really clear, meaning that if we look at the literature, there is not a clear opinion that emerges on the effect of climate change on freshwater availability. But if there is a widespread convincement that freshwater availability is decreasing for climate change. So this is one possible reason. Another reason is that water pollution is increasing, and this is sure. So why climate change could be debated, I mean, the effect of climate change on water resources could be debated, and it's not homogeneous over the Earth, so over the planet, the effect of climate change is different. We are, we for sure know that water pollution is increasing all over the planet, and the, the fact that water pollution is increasing, of course, decreases fresh water availability. And just think that if you go back to, uh, for 100 years, for sure, we know that 100 years ago, people went to the Pori River in Italy to take water to drink. And that this was perfectly allowed. The water was clean. This is not possible today. So we can use that water for irrigating the fields, but not for drinking. Or if we want to use it for drinking, we need to, uh, to perform water sanitation. So fresh water availability is indeed decreasing. 
and, uh, and therefore water resources management is becoming a topical issue. And there is a widespread convincement that in the next 50 years this will become uh, the major problem of humanity. I'm not really so sure because this was the same story that I heard 30 years ago. Uh, when I was a child, the people used to say on, on the newspaper, we used to see that by the year 2000, uh, water will finish, and it didn't finish. So I'm not really sure that in 50 years this will become a major problem, but indeed, it's an important problem, indeed. And keep in mind that uh, water resources availability and water resources management is a global problem, but need to be solved at the local level. This is challenging, because you cannot transfer water. Or you can, but only for a limited distance. So basically, the solution is local, but the problem is global. This is really challenging because when you talk about uh, CO2 emissions, uh, the problem is, is global, and uh, the solution needs to be uh, found at the global level. When you talk about talk about water, you know it, it's a global problem, and the solution needs to be found at the local level. This is challenging because it's the local administration that is involved. And, uh, and uh, the local administration, you know, doesn't have the knowledge and the tools to solve at the local level a global problem. This is really something challenging. If you ask to your major or your city, he doesn't know how to do that. He may know how to save water, but really, you know, the problem is very different depending on, on the location of the city. So, this is a, a unique feature, a global problem that needs to be solved at the, at the local level. So basically, what do we need to solve this problem? First of all, we need to know how much water is available. And uh, you may be amazed by what I'm saying. We don't know how much water is available. Do you know how much water we have in the groundwater beneath the ground of Bologna? We don't know that. We don't know to what extent we can pump the water from underground from, uh, you know, maybe 200 meters deep. There are people that, now today it's very easy, you dig a well and you go down for 200 meters and then you can take water. Do we know how much water can we take without uh, exhausting the resource? No, the answer is no, we don't know that. We try. We try to take water and uh, if we see that it finishes, then it means that we made a mistake. But we don't know. Um, for instance, I, I have a well in my, in my garden, and I try. And I see that water comes, so it means that I can use it. But really, there is no means, no scientific valid, and let me say, no, no scientific reliable means to estimate groundwater availability. We need to make progress. And also, do you know how much water is passing from a river? This is. The answer is no, you don't know that. Only if there is a measuring station which, with a lot of uncertainty, may tell you after tens of years how much water is passing from there, unless you have this data, you don't know how much water is passing it flows along the river. And an interesting exercise is to try to guess the water flow. And uh, let me define what the water flow is. The water flow in a river the water flow in a river let's define it. And keep in mind this is uh, something that you need to know really well. This is a possible question at the exam. Please, what is the water flow? And if you don't know what is the water flow, it's a big problem because it's a real basis. So what is the water flow in a river? First of all, you have to define what the river is. The river, we know what is the river, is a water body that is flowing from upstream to downstream. We can define the river in this way. A water body flowing. And uh, what is important to remark is that it's flowing. The river is flowing. I will get back to this concept. It's different from a lake or a reservoir where water is stored. The river is a water body that is flowing. And uh, the flow is identified by a main direction. So basically, when I see a river, 
from the, the top, I can identify a main direction which is uh, curvilinear. It's not a straight line. Usually, and uh, let, let me say always, is a curvilinear trajectory with curves. In any point of this trajectory, you can, with uh, a plane, you can cut the river perpendicularly to the velocity in this point. So let me repeat this. You have a trajectory, you take a point in the trajectory. In the trajectory, let, let, let's, let's say that you identify a drop of water into the river, you can identify a trajectory of this drop of water. And the river is such that for all the drops, the trajectory is more or less the same. Okay, then you can draw the velocity vector here, like this one. And then you can cut the river with a plane that is perpendicular to this vector. Now, what happens if you look at the river from downstream? You see something like that. Okay, and uh, this is uh, what we call the cross section. And uh, the main feature of the cross section is that the velocity vector comes from the comes perpendicularly from the cross section. So if I wanted to put in evidence the velocity vector here. It comes uh, out from the blackboard and perpendicular. Because by definition, I, I obtained this uh, cross section by cutting the river with a plane that is perpendicular to the velocity vector. And in this way, I identify the cross section. You have a background in hydraulics, so these concepts should be already known to you. So I'm just recalling them, but I'm not going into the details. If you need any clarification, ask questions. Okay? So it's now clear what a cross section is. Okay, the cross section is an area. Which we usually indicate with A. And we call it uh, the vetted area. The cross section has a free surface. I'm taking five more minutes and then I leave you. Sorry for that. And the free surface, if the river doesn't have uh, very significant curves, so if you look at the river from the top, there might be a situation where you see a very significant curve, so the water turns. If you don't have, turn I think is the correct terminology, if you don't have significant turns, the river is more or less straight, the free surface is horizontal, and we will always assume that we are in this situation. It's an hydraulic assumption. OK, so you have this free surface. And we usually use the symbol lowercase h to identify the water depth in the cross section. And we take the lower point of the cross section, and we compute the difference in the altitude between the lower point and the free surface. And this is called water depth in the cross section. Now, let me define the water flow, because I entered in this discussion because I wanted to define the water flow. OK, given a cross section, a river cross section, 
What is the water flow then? It's uh, the volume of water, I will repeat, that passes through the cross section in the unit time. So the water flow given a river cross section, the water flow in a river cross section is uh, the volume of water that passes through the cross section in the unit time. You understand that knowing the water flow, also called river flow or river discharge, or discharge, it depends on, on the on the American versus uh, uh, British English, or maybe it depends from my pronunciation, but in any case, I hope you understood. Uh, water flow or river flow or river discharge. Knowing the water flow is, is extremely important from the perspective of water resources management because uh, the amount of water that passes through the river, you can take it. You cannot take more. You may take less. But of course, this knowledge is extremely important. The water flow cannot be directly measured. You don't have an instrument to place into the river, which is measuring automatically the water flow. You need to measure other variables which allow you to compute the water flow with some uncertainty. So coming back to my main question, do we know what is the water flow in a river cross-section? No. We can measure it with some uncertainty. And an interesting exercise is to guess it. So you go over a bridge, like in the, in the Reno River, and you see water passing. So my question would be, in your opinion, how many cubic meters per second are passing below the bridge? This is something that is really difficult to guess. And uh, I would say that even with a lot of experience, it's not easy. But of course, you can get some, uh, some sensitivity to it. And this is an extremely interesting exercise. And I, I, I finish by telling you a story. When I was a student, a master's degree student, I went to visit a, a, an hydroelectric power plant on a, over a, a, an important bridge in Italy, the other, sorry, an important river, the other river close to, to Milan. And uh, we, had, uh, we were brought uh, there uh, by a very famous and old professor. He's still alive, but uh, uh, he was already well known for being uh, an extremely famous engineer and professor. And he brought us uh, uh, over the river because there was a dam uh, diverting the water flow for producing the hydroelectric power. And uh, he said, you students, uh, he asked uh, to us, you students, can you guess the river flow? And then it was really challenging because, you know, big river. And then we said, uh, we don't know, maybe 1,000 cubic meters per second. And uh, he said, yeah, uh, it's clear that you don't have experience. It's, but we just guessed, you know, 1,000, it's an easy number to guess. He said, oh, if you don't have experience, it's clear that it's much and much more. It may be 1,500. And then uh, the man uh, managing the dam came, and the professor asked, so what is the river distance now? And he said, 800 cubic meters per second. And, uh, and of course, we exploded laughing. And uh, this is just to, to clarify to you that it's not really easy. But it's uh, a useful exercise. So basically, at the end of the subject, you will be, we will learn something on estimating water resources availability to describe the main processes governing the hydrological cycle. Because uh, in order to describe water resources availability, we need to describe the hydrological cycle. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to provide solution to typical water resources management problems. OK, see you on Thursday, room 2.5, I guess.